Okay, the next installment in the uh, medical student ultrasound curriculum is the musculoskeletal section. And um, this can be incredibly difficult <laughs> when you first start doing it. Um, but in the end, I think you'll find that it's actually really um, intuitive and really lends itself to being useful in a multitude of ways for lots of different specialties. And um, I, it took me a while to kind of get comfortable with it. And I have to admit, there are a lot of people on the way that, that helped me with this. Dr. Buffard is a uh, PM&R and radiologist. The, the, I would say the world's expert on musculoskeletal ultrasound. And if anybody's interested in um, you know, hooking up with him for a summer medicine and a sports medicine fellowship, and uh, he's been a lot of help in teaching, and you guys will likely meet him uh, this week when you're doing your... Um, hands-on sessions. And then Ben Dubois is an orthopedic surgeon out of San Diego who uh, basically um, taught me a great hands-on course on the shoulder. He's sort of a shoulder expert down in San Diego. Again, local guy if you're interested. And then um, Alan Chim has really run with the shoulder, so to speak. And um, he's my current ultrasound fellow who did uh, the majority of the, um, the videos that you're going to see here. In fact, all the videos that you're about to see here in this talk. And uh, many thanks to him for uh, all the hours he put into this lecture. And then Stacy and Tim, Stacy um, and Tim were both volunteered to be the ultrasound models when we did the videos. So thanks to them as well. Now we're going to talk about three areas: the shoulder, the knee, and the wrist um, or the hand. And um, we're not going to go through any pathology. This is an anatomically based lecture. Um, you got to get the anatomy down first before you start moving on to the good stuff. So, but there is a lot of good stuff that you can do with ultrasound, and a lot of it actually, believe it or not, is as good as, or in some cases, even better than MRI. And um, and so that's what makes it so attractive. Now, you can see fractures, dislocations, um, or even subluxations, osteochondromatosis, bursitis, and all the various joints. Um, particularly in the shoulder, rotator cuff tears, uh, tendinosis, um, impingement, uh, ruptures of the tendon or partial ruptures or unstable, I'm sorry, unstable tendons, uh, pal paralabral cysts you can see, adhesive capsulitis, and also ultrasound is really good for doing um, guidance injections and aspirations. Now in the knee, we can see tendinosis of the quadriceps muscle, tears of the tendon and the muscle. We can see a tear of the patellar tendon, patellar tendinitis, fluid collections in all the joints, um, but in particular, it's very common to see this in the knee. You can see the panis and rheumatoid arthritis, patellar bursitis, uh, tears of the MCL. We're going to spend some time on the MCL. Um, it's very, very easy to see. And um, something called a Baker's cyst. and differentiating that from psoriatic arthritis, de Quervin's, tenosynovitis, uh, tendon tears of the wrist and the fingers, um, carpal tunnel syndrome, Now, the transducers that you want to really focus on, um, particularly the ones that we have access to all over the place, so the, linear, the linear transducer. Remember the linear probe, high frequency, best resolution. If I was stuck on a desert island and I can only bring one transducer with me, then this is the one I'd bring. The images are beautiful. Whenever I can get away with linear probe, I'll use it. Now there's also a hockey stick probe, which tend to have even higher frequencies. And there's an example of one down here. You can see how it's a little bit easier to manipulate in
stand back a little bit in order to get the optimal focal point, and that's why we have these uh, standoff pads. They're gelatinous pads that you can re reuse, um, and if you don't have one of those, you can just dunk the part in a water bucket. I've done a lot of that with the hands and the feet um, over the years. Um, but if it's something else around the shoulder maybe that's hard to dunk in a water bucket, you could use a standoff pad. Even take a, a glove, fill it up with ultrasound gel, and you have an immediate standoff pad. And for the most part, we're going to be in 2D mode, though some of the pathology will require power dopplers to look for uh, inflammation. Now, there's many benefits to using ultrasound. Obviously, we've been talked about these before. I'll just brush through this. Um, you can use it basically anywhere. And the major advantage it has over the other three imaging modalities, of course, is that it's real time. You're seeing tendons move in real time. You're seeing actual functionality of the structures. And that's a huge uh, benefit with ultrasound. And in particular with musculoskeletal, sometimes uh, there's a bit of a learning curve here, but you always have the other side to compare it to when you're worried about something pathologic related. And so if you have, you're not sure if you see a tendon tear or not, or it's a partial tendon tear, go look at the other side, um, assuming the patient hasn't had an amputation, and you should be able to compare it. And that's really uh, helpful. Of course, there's no radiation exposure, and um, it's safe. Now, the limitations are really making you comfortable. And that's why we integrate ultrasound into the four years of the medical school here, so that by the end of medical school, you feel like ultrasound is this natural extension of what you do. It's just sort of part and parcel. You feel confident behind it. And that requires uh, experience because it can be quite operator dependent. And uh, you can imagine you know, learning this uh, like I did after residency, um, required a lot, you know, sort of more hours and work put into it versus if I had it, you know, trickled in over the course of medical school and residency, it would have been, you know, much easier. I would have been much more confident right from the get-go. That being said, um, it's, it's not that hard to learn, actually. It just requires a little bit of commitment. Now, let's get into this here. There's um, soft and hard tissue that we can see. Most of the tissue is soft. It extends from the skin line uh, seen up here and down through the, uh, the hypodermis, also called the subcutaneous tissue. And uh, then there's the subcutaneous fascia seen here. That's that hypercoke line. And then below that, we can see you know muscle. And then finally, uh, there's bone. And the bone is the hard tissue. It's very dense. It strongly reflects the sound. And thus, it creates a very hyperechoic uh, cortex uh, landmark here. Now, Tendons um, are themselves uh, should be readily identifiable echoic and um, certainly much more hyperechoic than muscle. They have a fibrillar pattern and they should be um, completely visualized as a musculotendinous unit. Um, in some ways, it's a joint between the muscle uh, and the tendon, you know, that, that area where those, the muscle and the tendon joins together. Um, some people call that a joint. It's, um, you can see that musculotendinous unit throughout its complete range of motion. Now, if a tendon defect is visualized during this dynamic evaluation, a tendon injury really should be suspected. And um, there's another concept called anisotropy. Um, now, anisotropy, it's basically tissues that exhibit ultrasound properties that differ according to the direction of the ultrasound imaging. In other words, with muscles, and particularly tendons, depending on which angle you incinate them, a variable echogenicity. Now, as this video illustrates, the arrow, um, which I don't have, uh, but this arrow oh, here, this arrow points to <laughs> the, uh, the tendon as it's coming along here, and then suddenly there's this sort of drop-off, right? An obliquely angled ultrasound beam, and uh, and that's exactly what happened here. As it as the tendon was trying to come across this bone here, um, the ultrasound hit it at a different. Correct the angle, we can see the rest of that tendon again. So just be careful with that uh, concept of anisotropy. Steve from an obliquely angled ultrasound beam. See it with tendons mostly. Um, and here's a tendon taken through its range of motion here. As the joint gets ranged, we can see this tendon demonstrate a homogeneous and quite hyperechoic appearance. 
as it slides along its uh, tissue plane. Now muscle is hypoechoic, relatively speaking, and one can see the muscle itself um, with the um, overall, it's hypoechoic, but we can see the hyperechoic striae seen here um, in this fibrillar pattern. So if you line up that linear transducer in the long axis of the muscle, you can see these linear fibrillar striae going across, and in between the different muscle bundles is a multi-pennant, you know, it comes across in this multi-pennant uh, fashion here. And um, so this is sort of one muscle bundle over here, and this is another muscle bundle down here. And, um, you know, through musculoskeletal ultrasound. We flip that same transducer on that same muscle into the short axis view. And uh, now that uh, what was stretching out across the screen, that long fibrillar patterns, now look more punctate um, as opposed to the linear fibrillar pattern when you're in the short axis looking at muscle. The bone, too, now down here is, uh, w instead of stretching out across the screen, is seen here in its uh, kind of a radial pattern, um, very dense and uh, echogenic. And it depends where you insinate the muscle. It will really change as you as you you know, sort of fan down through its course. And so this is looking posteriorly in the back of the, the calf. And we can see the gastroc is very superficial and the soleus is uh, deep to it down here. Now, as I move down through these still images, we're going to go a little more distal here. And as I go distally, um, we can see the gastroc kind of starts to go away. The soleus remains pretty prominent. Now we can start to see the tibia uh, down here um, more medially, and uh, then we can see two bellies here of the gastroc, the soleus is down here, and when, we, when I use the real-time clip, very thinned out, soleus takes over as we go distally, now we're going more proximally, gastroc gets bigger, um, the two bellies of it there, gastroc, soleus down here. Uh, muscles here quite easily on ultrasound. Now, what about the joints? Um, a lot of people call this the seagull sign. Um, when you've got one uh, bone coming up to another bone, you can see the, um, the sort of the soft bony ends coming together. See this? And this is the proximal um, first uh, phalanx right here. And where those two things come together, we can see this is that joint space in between the two. And then this uh, phalanx goes along, and then there's a, another one out here. And so when we're making out these um, these space, and unless there's really fluid there, it's hard to see uh, sometimes exactly where the bony ends uh, start and stop. But it is an articular um, place where they come together, and we can see in this case um, their ends as they approach one another. In this case, this patient does not have any fluid in the joint space. If there was fluid there, it would um, be pretty obvious, anechoic. And because bones are so easy to see on ultrasound, um, fractures are very simple, actually. And I know I'm focusing on anatomy, not pathology, but, I mean, it just, you can really see these step-offs quite easily um, with, with fractures, actually. Um, and the nice thing is you basically hand the transducer to the patient, say, put it where it hurts, and then you'll see the step off. But this is what intact cortex looks like. We can see that hyperechoic line coming along here. We see this hyperechoic line here, joint space. We can see this hyperechoic line coming along here. And in, you know, in these cases, either muscle um, or in this case tendon will be uh, superior to the bone, or I should say superficial to the bone. And again, these cort fractures, these cortical fractures, super easy to see. I mean, boom, big step off. And a lot of times you'll get this hematoma formation in between the two bony ends. Um, here's a clavicle, boom, big step off. Other part of it's down here. Again, hematoma formation. And uh, this is a much smaller step off here. But we can see fractures all over the body with ultrasound from the skull to the sternum, places that sometimes it's difficult to pick up with an x-ray. And uh, ultrasound will, will uh, pick it up, scaphoid fractures all that. Now, we're going to talk now specifically about the shoulder, and this is probably the most commonly performed musculoskeletal application of ultrasound, and um, in terms of the, the indication.
Now the biceps tendon is seen in the um, in the in the bicipital groove, and so what you're looking for is this uh, structure right here. Here's the short axis of um, the head of the humerus, so we can see this is the area there. Now we know why they call it the bicipital groove. The biceps tendon fits actually quite nicely, and this is the short axis here, and then um, this is the the long axis down here. And you're really looking for that uh, echogenic oval structure um, that's in that uh, bicipital groove. It enters uh, deep to the transverse humeral ligament, and the fibers can be seen to extend into the uh, subscapularis tendon that's essentially located between the greater and lesser uh, tuberosity and um, deep to the deltoid. Pec major tendon stabilizes uh, this area at the, at the level of the myotendinous junction. And in the longitudinal plane, we can appreciate these fibrillar uh, patterns seen here. Alan, show us how to find the biceps tendon. The structure that I'm interested in is the biceps tendon and the bicipital groove. And I'll put the probe actually in a transverse orientation with the indicator pointed to the patient's right, or actually laterally, depending on what shoulder it is. So what I first identify on the ultrasound image is essentially the the greater tuberosity on this side right here and then the lesser tuberosity on right here. And in the middle you have this this anechoic structure, but if you notice like like this fan this way, it becomes very bright and that's and in the bicipital groove. A long axis view of the biceps tendon. I'm going to start from the short axis and hold the probe and actually um, put a finger on, on the patient's skin so that I know that um, I'm not, the probe isn't going to move anywhere. And I'm essentially just going to rotate 90 degrees with the indicator point towards the patient's head. And what I have when I do this is actually a view of the, of the biceps tendon and the long axis. I'm trying to get it right here. Here we are. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going so your biceps tendon should look very fibular, very linear, um, and uh, a little hyperechoic as well. And essentially I'm going to go until I hit the pectoralis, which is about right here. This is the pectoralis ligament right here. So if there's actually any fluid, what we'll see is that uh, that uh, there will be an anechoic uh, surrounding or cavity uh, around the biceps tendon. Or if there's actually a partial tear or, or a full tear, we'll see that the fibrillar pattern disappears. Now the subscapularis has a multi-pennant structure that arises anterior along the anterior aspect of the scapula. Uh, it inserts on the lesser tuberosity and if you can see there's some bursa there that's just sort of uh, anterior to the tendon and when you externally rotate the arm therefore you can make out this area um, a little bit uh, a little bit better once again Dr. Allen Chan. So in order to get an image of the subscapularis remember that the subscap actually attaches on your lesser tuberosity which is medial so when I actually identify the lesser tuberosity up here I'm going to have the patient slowly externally rotate and when the patient externally rotates, you get the actual subscap in the long axis view right here. And remember that the, my probe is actually still in the transverse orientation. If I want to get a, a, a picture of the subscap in, uh, in the short axis view, I'll rotate my probe 90 degrees. And what I get is essentially the subscap in the short axis view with the hemal head some of the articular uh, cartilage right here and then the subscap up on top. So that was kind of weird. Um, it confuses me sometimes. Like, wait, the probe is transverse, but the subscapularis is longitudinal. How does that work? Well, if you think about it, here we have the probe in a transverse plane like this, but the muscles are running in a longitudinal fashion underneath the transverse probe. I'll say that again.
And the opposite is true. So if the probe is in a longitudinal axis, well, we're going to see these um, the contour of these dot-like formation here of that subscapularis when it's in its transverse plane. Now, what about the supraspinatus? Remember, that's the one that rides right up here on top of the scapula. So therefore, if, uh, if you have the patient right on top of it, then you're going to see uh, this uh, supraspinatus tendon coming across here in its uh, longitudinal plane because it's running in this fashion here. And uh, we'll have Dr. Allen explain it even better. So in order to get the supraspinatus tendon at its insertion point at the greater tuberosity of the it's actually up to how the patient uh, internally rotate his shoulder so that uh, the supraspinatus tendon uh, drops into the anterior view. And this is what I see actually on ultrasound. Uh, essentially the supraspinatus tendon attaches right here at the greater tuberosity and this is also uh, uh, known as the critical zone because uh, the vascular supply is, is not as good as at other points at, at the tendon insertion. So this is actually where you'll see a lot of pathology. The, uh, in the transverse view of the supraspinatus tendon, um, basically, um, you're looking for where it inserts on that uh, anterior facet of the um, greater tuberosity. And uh, the normal thickness of the structure is about six millimeters. Um, and it's the same on both sides, whether it's the dominant side or the non-dominant side. Now, a lot of people say that this structure running across like this kind of looks like a bird's beak. I don't know if you can appreciate that or not. Um, sort of the way like a, a bird's beak would come across. Um, I don't know, maybe a little bit. Anatomy, you could see this here. This is the, the superficial area then where the skin is and then the subcutaneous fat. And finally, we get down to that deltoid muscle. The superficial muscle that you see is the deltoid muscle. Then you get down a little bit deeper, we can actually make out this bursa really, um, this is a very thin hypochoic uh, sliver right here. And then deep to that is the supraspinatus tendon, that bird's beak structure. Deep to that is cartilage and then bone uh, seen right here with its characteristic shadowing. Alan's going to describe how to find the transverse. So from the long axis of the supraspinatus, all you have to do is just rotate the probe 90 degrees. So more perpendicular um, and point pretty much uh, upwards towards the ceiling. And what you get is the supraspinatus in short axis view. You have the humeral head. Uh, you have the articular cartilage in between the supraspinatus and the humeral head. And you have the top. Perfect. Okay. Now we're going to take the probe and put it on. And when we put it on the posterior shoulder, what we see here is quite well is this, um, the glenoid of the scapula, how it interacts with the humerus. We call that the glenohumeral joint. And in between the two is this posterior labrum. It's this triangular shaped structure here. And yeah, we can see infraspinatus coming across here um, just on top of the, uh, the glenoid. But I want you to think about the anatomy, how you would put the probe on the back of the shoulder and so the first muscle you see really here at the top is uh, deltoid and then you get deep to it and then you can start to see these bony uh, landmarks. So Alan's going to explain this better than I can. Next we're going to move to the posterior shoulder and the first thing I capture is actually the humeral shaft and in, in the short axis. So this is the humeral shaft right here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the probe superiorly with the also with the anterior point laterally and what you'll see is that you'll go, when you go to the humeral head, it becomes all knobbly. Once it becomes knobbly and, and, and large, you actually start. And once you go more medially, you actually capture the infraspinatus tendon insertion onto the greater tuberosity right here. And in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to have the patient that infraspinatus actually contracting and then have the patient go back into neutral and you can see that infraspinatus moving right there. Deep to that, the infraspinatus, you actually have 
the, the humeral head and the glenoid right here, and right here this, this hyperechoic structure, which sometimes appears triangular, is the actual posterior labrum. Okay, well that wraps up all we're going to do with the shoulder. We're going to move now into the knee, and the quadriceps tendon is actually quite easy to see. The um, femoral fat that we can see on top of the, the femur here uh, quite often. And here's Alan explaining it. So here I'm Im imaging the long axis or longitudinal starts onto your superior patella right here. This is a femur right here and you can appreciate a, a striped manicoic uh, fluid which is a prepatellar fat right here. And when I actually have the patient flex her knee, you can see that the, that actually extends out the quadriceps tendon. So to be clear, this is the femur down here. He initially said this was the femur here. That's actually the tibia. Slight uh, error I just noticed. So in the beginning of his So femur, patella, and this is that uh, quadriceps tendon coming across here. It's easy to get uh, mixed up. You can imagine how many takes we had when we did this originally. But I'm going to keep rolling. Now we're in the transverse plane. Transverse, it gets a little bit harder to see. This is the femur here, seen as transverse plane, and this is that quadriceps tendon seen here. And as we, what we're doing is we're taking the probe, we're going more superiorly and then more distally, and that's basically what's happening in this video. So we get, eventually get into where the muscle is and it stops being tendon. Um, and then we come back down to where um, the tendon is. The tendon's got that fibrillar uh, pattern to it. When it's in the short axis, it looks sort of punctate. Uh, the still image represents it here. And remember, there's always that uh, prefemoral fat pad just uh, just above the femur there. Now Alan's going to show you how to do this in the short axis. So you can see that the, in the short axis the quadriceps muscles will actually turn into the quadriceps tendon right here and you can just follow that as it goes into the And this is the patella right here. Pretty easy to see. Okay, now what I did next was I wanted to see the attachment from the patella all the way down to the tibia down here. And so I couldn't get it all on one view. So I got like this part of the tendon and then I got this part of the tendon as it went onto the tibia. And I basically stitched the images together here using um, the mask feature in Keynote. Really easy to do and kind of cool looking at how it comes across like that, um, the patellar tendon uh, seen there. And here's Alan describing how to do that a little bit better. So next we're going to take, take a long, long axis, axis view, view of the, the patellar, patellar tendon. tendon. It inserts on the inferior patella and you can trace it with its fibular pattern all the way down until it actually inserts onto your tibial tuberosity right here. This is the tibia and the, and the tibial tuberosity right here. Perfect. Okay. Now let's take the probe from that sort of anterior approach and now let's move it later, I'm sorry, medially to get a coronal approach. When we come from the side of the body, it's coronal. And so we're going to move it into the coronal view from the medial aspect of the knee. And what we can see quite easily here on this cone down view is the femur, the tibia, and in between the femur and the tibia is this medial meniscus, quite easy to see on ultrasound, and even easier to see, I think, is this medial collateral ligament as it's coming across. In fact, we can see both the um, superficial and, as my arrow is pointing along, the superficial and the deep aspect of the MCL. The deep aspect is right here, and there's a little bit of anechoic uh, material in between that two areas, a little bit of a um, maybe some fibro fatty tissue, what some people call a little bit of a, maybe it's a bursa that's in between here. Um, but, um, but it's a very characteristic pattern. Let me have Alan show you how he did it here. So now I'm, I'm in, imaging the, the superficial and deep fibers of the medial collateral ligament and just deep the medial meniscus. 
And here is the femur, and here's the tibia right here. Awesome. Okay. Now we're going on to the wrist, and then this lecture is over. So just hang with me here for another few minutes. This is a trans. by radialis and the median nerve and the palmaris longus. Now, I would never expect uh, really me or anybody to pick those out based on a still image. And that's really where um, I need to make a very critical point here with all of musculoskeletal ultrasound is that you're moving the probe a lot in order to view structures. And so um, what we did was we moved the probe up and down uh, Stacy's arm probably 20 or 30 times before we concluded that this was the flexor carpi radialis and that was the median nerve and that was the palmaris longus. And so here's Alan doing uh, so this is this a is median structure or a vesicular structure. To the ulnar side, you actually have the palmaris longus, the flexi carpi. To confirm that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to trace more proximally, and, and you can see that, that the FCR and the, 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 the palmaris longus and the FCR direction. actually go into muscle, whereas the median nerve continues on in, in its vesicular pattern. Yeah, so it really took moving up and down the arm to confirm that that was those structures. Uh, you can even see the, the distal radius here, maybe a little bit of the ulna. This is the uh, radial artery seen over here. So we do that a lot um, clinically too, like when I'm about to do a procedure where maybe I'm going to um, do a regional nerve block, block up uh, the median nerve, um, radial nerve. can see in a longitudinal axis, we can see the radius as it comes along here, and then we can see the lunate, and then we can see the capitate. And so these are the little joint spaces in the wrist, and the uh, flexor carpi radialis is coming along here uh, superiorly. Again, this took a lot of moving the probe around to confirm I was looking at those structures. And if I come a little bit more towards the thenar eminence, what I can see then is the scaphoid um, bone here. Uh, and we can see that flexor carpi radialis is coming along, and this is the scaphoid. I hit the little zoom function on the sonocyte, and the scaphoid blew up, and um, it's nice to see that bony cortex there of the scaphoid. So you can pick out these bones in the wrist. Um, uh, actually, uh, it's not that difficult once you get your, your bearings, and um, then you can move on into the hand and check out the pulley system of the hand. Here we have the uh, third metacarpal coming along, and then it terminates, and then we can see the proximal phalanx, uh, right here, and this is the joint space um, uh, right here, and we can see the tendon coming across uh, quite well. In fact, if you flex the fingers, you can see this tendon moving back and forth. Now, we didn't use a water bath here. We used lots of extra gel, as you can see. Ideally, though, you would put the hand in a bucket of water. The probes are all waterproof. That's fine. You could put the probe in there, and you can actually see this uh, probably a, a little bit better. And if I move more distally down the finger, I can see here, this is, uh, it looks like it's the short axis of the proximal phalanx, but actually um, some uh, the probe lost contact with the skin here, and actually we're just not seeing the signal very well, but the finger sort of terminates here in its long axis, uh, the proximal phalanx does, I should say. And then we've got this uh, PIP joint, and then here's that middle phalanx, and then the DIP joint is here, and here's that distal phalanx seen over here, and the tendon's marching its way along. Now, this little area right here looks like there could be a tendon disruption, um, but uh, but it's not. This is just that, uh, remember that concept when the probe... ...anisotropy, and that's all that is right there, some anisotropy, maybe a little bit more anisotropy going on right there. So it's, it's uh, just wanted to kind of point that out. Well, that basically concludes everything uh, that we're going to try to get through today. I mean, I didn't cover anything with the hip or the ankle or the elbow um, or the, you know, really didn't get into the foot um, or um, many other structures that we can see in the musculoskeletal system. We focused on the shoulder and the knee and the wrist, a little bit of the hand, um, just to kind of give you an overview of what these different tissue types look like and some of the functionality. And keep in mind, it's a whole, what a lot of people refer to musculoskeletal ultrasound as, I hear this quote all the, over and over again, is MSK is the wild, wild west of ultrasound. And so um, a, lot, a lot of uh, future work that could be done here, but, um, but certainly um, it's something to be um, 
you know, familiar with, and I think it really helps to round out your understanding of anatomy and uh, some of the functionality of the MSK system. And um, you can imagine how many takes we have. We just have a couple of little bloopers here. Alan is, uh, you know, he's he's pretty um, pretty uh, serious guy, I would say, and it's funny to see it when he messes up and stuff. So, so this is a long of axis view of the, of the patellar tendon inserting. Actually, take it back. <laughs> this is the quadriceps, but it's a, it's the same it's the same tendon. So. It's the same tendon. Uh, and then um, and then Alan uh, drops an f bomb. Uh, so right this here. is a long axis view of the patellar tendon. You can see that it inserts. Fuck! I did it again. <laughs> okay, sorry guys. See now I have to make this podcast explicit. All right, thank you very much, and um, have fun in your scanning sessions.